Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the most important recording projects ever. And today's selection, and this is really a major one, is the complete player piano studies of Conlon Nancaro. I mean, wow, what an amazing body of work. This is the, the original release of his player piano studies um, by Nancaro himself um, on his, it was originally released on the label 1750 Arch. That's what it was called in four volumes. And here it is on Other Minds. Um, this is a reissue. However, there is another equally important and possibly more readily available series. Well, there are a couple now, actually. There's one ongoing one on MD and G. I think it's finished. And then there's this one um, on five CDs instead of four on Vergo, who was his publisher. Vergo is the recording wing of Schott, which is, uh, you know, the great German music publisher. And there's like some extra volumes and things tacked on here as well. Now, Conlon Nankaro is was an amazing composer. He was a genuine American original, um, one of those guys who invented his own musical language. And he invented it solely through the medium of the player piano. And the reason he used the player piano is because, first of all, he wanted to take the human element out of music entirely, um, which is kind of creepy given the fact that Music is above all a human activity, but that's something that a lot of 20th century composers did. Leonard Bernstein talked about it, about the crisis of faith in humanity following World War II and the horrors of nuclear warfare and, and the Holocaust and whatnot, when a lot of composers decided that people weren't worth making art about. And so they decided to do things either by computers or mechanically or in ways that that took the human element out of it. But from a purely musical perspective, Nancaro had the most amazing conception of what music could be. And that conception involved crazily fast tempos and unbelievable aggregations of notes in, 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 in micro intervals or micro, not intervals, micro, micro seconds, nanoseconds and things like that. I mean, sonically, sonic sculptures and things like that. The only way you could get these things in the 1930s and 40s before the electronic music existed was through mechanical means. And so he adapted the player piano to his purposes and his entire body of work became a series of studies for player piano. And these things involved, you know, rhythms that, that had you know, irrational time signatures, irrational numbers like three pi over 72, and you know, just really crazy things that you can do mechanically, but that you can't do physically. And in order to do this, he spent his entire life, and I mean his entire life, punching holes in paper in piano rolls that he could play on his player pianos. Um, and it would take years, sometimes absolutely years, for him to place every single note and punch and hole in these piano rolls. Really, I mean, he, he was out of his mind. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. But out of his mind in a brilliant way because he was uncovering musical objects and musical rhythms and, and musical counterpoint and aggregations of sound and things that had never been heard before. And doing it in a very artistic way. I mean, it's not like his studies are... are are awful to listen to. They're not. They're fascinating. You can't listen to a lot of them at once. I would not suggest going whole hog and spending hours at them, but they they are fascinating. Some of them use jazz influences and tunes. Some of them are completely atonal. Some of them, you know, they, they, they run the whole gamut of musical styles, but all of them do things that human performers probably would not have the ability to do or not do easily. Nowadays, there have been transcriptions of these pieces for actual ensembles, and they have attempted to play them. But I'm a purist. I think it's so much more fun to hear them in all of their clackety-clack player piano, honky-tonk original glory, because it's just that, that sonority was somehow, somehow 
part of the uh, part of the part of the deal, you know. And so the music is amazing. And the only way we're really going to experience his music is on recordings. I mean, I, I, I in later in his life, as he became recognized and people were more interested in hearing his stuff, you know, they would go to his house and listen to his player pianos. Or, but you have to find a player piano. And then what are you going to do? Just put it on a stage and stick a thing in it and then have this audience sitting there and then you walk away and it just push go and then it just goes you know. I mean, somehow that doesn't seem like a rewarding live event type thing. Just as the music itself is somewhat dehumanized or anti-humanized, I mean, the experience of hearing it it needs to be done through mechanical or electronic means to have its best effect. A, there's something weird. I mean, right? I mean, about these people sitting there in their amphitheater staring at a player piano. So, so I, I mean, and it is in a way domestic music. I mean, it's piano music. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's like unlike anything else, unlike anything else at all. And it was only through the medium of recordings that he could become known, that his music would be recognized. And like so many 20th century mavericks, he, he basically invented his own musical language. There's a whole school of people who did that sort of thing. Composers like Harry Parch, composers like Messiaen, composers who are, some of them are reasonably popular because they're reasonably, you know, approachable through conventional means. But they still managed to create a, a musical syntax um, that was absolutely personal and unique. However, reliant to a degree on prior tradition it might have been. So Conlon Nancaro is one of those guys. And it, I think he was one of the most original voices in 20th century music. He discovered more about music than in his lifetime that most composers, he, most composers have the opportunity to do. It was his gift, his imagination, and the recording project to capture his player piano studies, whichever one you get, doesn't really make that much difference. But the project to capture these is absolutely one of the most important recording projects ever, particularly for 20th century music. Um, if you care about 20th century music and if you care about expanding the language of what music can do and what music can be, Nankero or Nankero or however you want to pronounce it doesn't make any difference. It does not. I mean, he's definitely one of the ways to go. So find it and savor it in small doses. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.